So I'm going to talk about the retina and beyond today, and I'm going to try and get us to the visual cortex in this in this neural processing. But um, we're going to start by explaining what's happening. We're going to get to the retina, and we're going to get to the subcortical structures that the retina communicates to. A really important concept, whether you are going on in the sensation and perception field or in medicine or in anything like physical therapy, um, is this, this idea of a neuron's receptive field. So the receptive field of a neuron is the area on the receptors that influences the firing rate of a neuron. So if I'm a receptor and I'm firing, and I whether I have an excitatory influence or an inhibitory influence on that on the neuron down the line, whatever neuron I'm talking about, then I am part of that neuron's receptive field. So just remember that it's um, whether that influence is excitatory or inhibitory. Either way, if I'm having an influence, I'm part of that neuron's receptive field. Receptive fields have different sizes and shapes and properties, and we're going to start since we're starting in the retina. We're going to start very simple with the center surround receptive field. And this is also, so these are the retinal ganglion cells in the retina, as well as the um, cells in the lateral geniculate nucleus have this really simple center surround receptive field. How did we find out about these receptive fields? Well, a lot of this research in vision was done on cats. They have pretty similar visual systems as, as humans. And so, um, there's been a lot of research on cats. And so what they would do in this kind of case is we're looking at the retinal ganglion cells, remember coming from the eye, their axons make up the optic nerve. And so we're gonna record the signal from a single optic nerve fiber to see what is this neuron's receptive field. And what they would do is anesthetize the cat so that the eye is very still. And then we know that because we get this inverted and flipped image, that if I'm shining a light, and I'm going to use the example of light, but whatever their stimuli were, um, it worked. So if I'm shining a light up at A, it's going to uh, be hitting the retina down at A prime. If I'm shining a light uh, straight forward at B, it's going to be hitting B prime. And if I'm shining a light down at C, it's going to be hitting up at C prime in that inverted and flipped image that we're getting on the back of the retina. So the cat would be anesthetized and would be still. And um, what you can see is the screen there that shows A, B, and C and a little circle on it. That is the screen. And then the graphs to the right are the measurements of the firing rate of this particular neuron that we're talking about. And so if they shine a light anywhere in a, in that outer area, you can see what is the spontaneous activity of the neuron. And um, I remember talk, Jessica talking very clearly about excitatory versus inhibitory activity and raising the probability of um, depolarizing to the point of sending an action potential, but I'm not sure. I think I remember her talking about spontaneous activity, but I'm going to say it again just in case that um, neurons have a spontaneous activity every once in a while they fire okay so i'm not changing the firing rate of the neuron anywhere in a in that larger field if they shine the light anywhere in b uh, you can see at the bottom when the light goes on and the light goes off and if we look at the b figure the light goes on and we see a fast firing rate so we see this excitatory influence where the neuron is firing faster and it stops when the light goes off and actually there's this little time of inhibition uh, when the spontaneous rate stops. If they shine the light out somewhere in C, so in that inhibitory surround, what you see is when the light goes on, there is inhibition. We actually turn off the neuron's spontaneous firing rate. And what you'll also notice is when the light goes off, there is this rebound effect. Neurons have this kind of rebound effect that when we're inhibiting them, uh, then they're going to fire a few times uh, as, a, as a response to that inhibition. So if we look at the response of center surround receptive fields, if we start our light off in a very small ball of light in the center and we turn it on in A, 
we can see this faster firing rate, faster than spontaneous activity, as we're seeing this excitatory activity. If we make that ball of light larger so that it fills up that excitatory space, you can see that the firing rate in V gets even faster, right? So we're responding to intense stimulus with faster firing rate. If we move that, we get that light larger and it starts to hit that inhibitory surround, what you see is in C, the, um, spot, the firing rate gets a little bit slower than it was in A. It doesn't quite look like spontaneous firing. It's, it's still a little bit faster than that, but we do see some inhibition. And then in D, as we fill up that inhibitory space, we're going to make the neuron go back down to its spontaneous rate, maybe even a little bit more slowly as I'm hitting both excitatory and inhibitory space with my light. So these inhibitory processes in the retina, uh, they come out as lateral inhibition. And how do we know about lateral inhibition? Well, originally this research was done on a horseshoe crab in the, the limulus, and it was done by Hartline and his colleagues. And so they were looking at, the, um, at one of the eyes of the limulus, and they had this, I'm going to say it wrong this time, but Oma, Omatadili, I think I said it right, Omatadili, that are, um, are kind of being shown here in my, in my picture that they are receptors, and each of those receptors at the top they have their own lens, so they have a really different kind of structure to their eye than we do. They're each sending back their information to the horseshoe crab's brain. And you can also see what's going on there is this lateral plexus that is connecting all of the omatadili. Okay, so they shine their light at A. And when they shine their light only at A, we see this pretty fast, so in the A figure, this pretty fast uh, firing rate of the neuron that's excitatory. Okay, and then they shine a light out at uh, one of those omatadili at B. And what we see in the B figure, A plus B, there's a slowdown of that firing rate. Again, not quite, not back down to spontaneous activity, but it's not as fast as A. Uh, light being shined at A just itself. They got a more intense light so that it's hitting a few receptors over there at B. And what we see in, uh, in C is an even, even larger slowdown of the firing rate. So they discovered this lateral inhibition. And in the horseshoe crab, this is happening across that lateral plexus. But for humans, uh, our retina is set up really differently. So if we look at what's happening at our retina, okay, we have one lens out at the very top and it's hitting um, information sitting all of these photoreceptors. We have 126 million photoreceptors. And this is actually that kind of synopsis there of the photoreceptors, 126 million going to the bipolar cells where we see convergence to the retinal ganglion cells so that we can send 1 million, uh, 1 million axons uh, through the optic nerve to the brain that we're at, we're just adding a little bit to that and what's happening at that convergence um, between the photoreceptors and the bipolar cells are these horizontal cells. Between the bipolar cells and the retinal ganglion cells are these amacrine cells. And those cells that look like they're doing this kind of, they're behaving and they're, they're connected in a perpendicular kind of way to um, the photoreceptors, bipolar cells, and ganglion cells, they are allowing for that kind of lateral inhibition that we saw the lateral plexus doing for the for the limulus, we have it in these in these other cells. Um, just so you know, the picture over there, I corrected this on the other slides, but I haven't done that yet for these slides where the the horizontal cells and the amacrine cells are mixed up. On the pictures from the publishers, they're not in the they're not mixed up in the book, but they were in the PowerPoint slides. I won't ask you anything specific about that ordering, as long as you know photoreceptors to bipolar cells, to retinal ganglion cells, to the lateral geniculate nucleus, to the visual cortex, you're, you're good for the sort of the pathway. And just kind of know that those horizontal and amacrine cells are doing this, are providing the lateral inhibition. And just to show what this, what this means in, a, in one of those circuits that we've, you, we've used a few times now, if I have a little ball of light and it's hitting 
um, receptor number four. Uh, the, the Ys there are showing you excitatory connections. And just so you know, there's just lines. In this case, the vertical lines, just the lines are showing inhibitory connections. But four has an excitatory connection to bipolar cell B. And if we're looking at the firing rate of bipolar cell B, uh, that ball of light is going to say is going to have B firing at a rate of one. And these are, again, kind of made up just arbitrary numbers, but just bear with me with my arbitrary numbers. If I take that ball of light and I pull it out and give it, then I have a ball or a, a bar of light that's hitting receptors three, four, and five now. They are three, four, and five. All of those receptors have excitatory connections with bipolar cell B. And so I raise the firing rate of B to three, three units of activation. Okay, I'm going to make it now an even longer bar of light. So now I'm hitting two through six with my longer bar of light. And you can see that two has an excitatory connection with A. And A, in this kind of lateral inhibition, has an inhibitory connection with B. So, and six has an excitatory connection with bipolar cell C. And bipolar cell C has an inhibitory connection with B. So now, I'm getting three, four, and five, those three are giving me excitatory information, but two and six, those two, through bipolar cells A and C, are giving B inhibitory information. So now I've slowed back down that firing rate, back down to one, and it kind of, that B is gonna respond the same to a single little ball of light hitting four as to a long bar of light hitting two through six. Okay. If I make that bar of light even longer so that it hits one through seven, well, one and two are both sending excitatory information to A, so B is getting more inhibitory information. Six and seven are both sending excitatory information to C, B is getting more inhibitory information. So now I'm slowing, slow, slowing the firing rate of B down even more. So now it's, it's under one. It, it's probably more towards its spontaneous rate. It might even be, depending on, um, kind of the amount of space, it actually looks to me like this would be slightly lower than a spontaneous activity. And you may ask me, so why do we want such a crazy system? What, what does this give us and why does that, why does that, why? <laughs> and at the very end of all this, so first I'm going to give you some kind of some proofs, uh, if you will, of um, some experiences that we have because of this lateral inhibition and then I'm going to finally tell you this is this is how really a sensory system has to work we don't want to see absolute amounts of light uh, that would be overwhelming and we wouldn't see the changes and the contrasts as what as being what's important what we want to see first of all is relative amounts of light and we need those changes and those contrasts to be to pop out They're, They are important for us to see the ends of tables or or whatever that we, we need to, to see to navigate um, in our world. But so I'm going to start with these proofs or really explanations of um, how lateral inhibition is influencing some of these illusions that we have. Uh, the first I'm going to give you the Hermann grid which uh, we talked about before as this kind of phenomenological measure. If I just ask you what you see, and many people say they see these kind of gray ghosts, right? So if you're looking at the, the white space in my kind of tic-tac-toe board here, and you're looking at the, inter the left, most, left top intersection, then what you'll see is um, it's clearly the lightest there. And then as you kind of move out, it actually appears slightly darker. But then in the other intersection, there are these gray spots, pretty noticeable gray spots. And if you move your eyes to those gray spots, they disappear and, and the spot moves to, to where you were just looking as they why they're kind of called they're called ghosts. OK, so we're going to discuss what's happening at the intersections and how this is different than what's happening in those kind of in those kind of corridors. So I'm going to start with. 
receptor A or really bipolar cell A, okay, and I'm going to compare it right now to um, B, C, D, and E. Actually, what I'm going to do later is compare it to what's happening at bipolar cell D. But A, so bipolar cell A, let's just say its initial response is 100 units. And I'm using this, again, it's an arbitrary number, but 100 being a large number because we're on the white space. Okay, and so bipolar cell B is also sending on 100 units. C is sending on 100 D 100, E 100. Those are their initial responses anyway. But so if I'm B and I'm sending on 100 units of activation, let's just say I'm sending 10% of that laterally as inhibition. So if I'm sending 10%, B is sending 10% laterally as inhibition, C 10 as inhibition, D 10 units of inhibition, E 10 units of inhibition and that since they're all sending that laterally to A I'm going to take that initial response of 100 subtract that 40 and A's final response okay like in the family feud final response is 60. Now I'm going to compare that to what's happening at bipolar cell D okay in the corridor and I'm going to take these same the same they're giving us a basic idea of what's around D um, and bipolar cell D is the initial response is 100 again and it's getting inhibition from A that inhibition 10% of 100 is 10 inhibition from F now F and H they're in the black area so let's say they're sending on their initial response is 20 a much lower number than 100 because I'm in the black area so F is sending 10% of its information as inhibition so 2 G is in the white space so it's sending its inhibition 10% of 100 is is 10 and H is sending its 10% inhibition to D and its 10% of 20 is 2 so now I'm subtracting that 24 from 100 and D's final response okay final response is 76 so I'm going to come back to this Hermann grid, okay, and just notice that when you look at the, when you look at an intersection, you're using your fovea, and remember those foveal cones have a one-to-one -one communication with the brain, so there isn't the same kind of um, convergence that we see. And so the corridors might look a teeny bit grayer than where you're actually foveating, but what you'll really notice is the gray ghosts, right, those gray spots in the intersections. And that is because it is relative light in comparison to the corridors. And let's, I'm just going to use those arbitrary units again. If, I'm, if those are sending on set 76 units of activation, and in the intersections, I'm sending on 60 units of activation, those intersections are going to look slightly uh, darker or grayer than the corridors. So that's lateral inhibition used to explain what's happening in the Hermann grid. Okay, and I'm going to use this example of simultaneous contrast as just another example of what um, of an illusion that really lateral inhibition explains pretty well. Your author uses the Chevrolet illusion. I'm used to calling them mock bands. It used numbers again, and I know that some people have a a real uh, bad reaction to numbers and they feel like they're getting into math territory and they have this kind of anxiety and I like to just whenever I can um, give an example that's not numerical as well you all will never have to walk through any of these examples of, of how lateral inhibition explains these um, illusions but so usually I do this in class and I ask um, so the inner gray square the inner gray squares which one appears darker the one on your left or the one on your right and most people although some people this doesn't work for most people say the one on the left appears darker than the one on the right and I'm being very careful with my language because you all might know the punchline 
I'm going to tell you that these are sending, those two squares in the center are sending the exact same wavelength information to your eyes. They're the exact same shade of gray. And I'm sorry if you don't believe me, it's, it's true. Um, but because it's a really strong illusion for those of us on whom it does work. Uh, so what's happening here is the, the outer area, so what would be sending potentially lateral inhibition, on the left is a lighter area, and so it's sending more inhibition, right, because it's a lighter color. The one on the right is a darker color, so it's sending less inhibition. So the one on the right appears a bit lighter because there's less inhibition. The one on the left appears darker because there's more inhibition. And I like to show this explanation that just uses the wider arrows to show that that lighter area is sending more inhibition, which is why that one on the left appears darker. And the area on the right, because it's darker, is sending less inhibition shown with the narrow arrows. This is all really hard to say. and I've done this a couple times because it's so hard to say. But this uh, narrow arrow is showing less inhibition, so that appears lighter. And now I'm going to talk about White's illusion, which lateral inhibition cannot explain. And um, you'll notice that there's actually, I think your book now has a different rendition of the Hermann grid where you don't see those gray ghosts and which lateral inhibition also cannot explain why. Why don't you see those gray ghosts in the, in the second example? But just to show that uh, it's not all easily explained by lateral inhibition and what's going on at the retina, at the level of the retina, sometimes we have to take into account uh, what's happening at the visual cortex. And so if we look at White's illusion, most of us, again, most of us have this experience. If I asked you which gray rectangle appears darker, the one on the left, A, or the one on the right, B. Most of us have this experience that A appears to be darker than B. And I'm again going to tell you it's the exact same, they're the exact same shade of gray, same wavelength information being sent to the eyes. So what's different about A and B is the context. But if you look at what's around A, a is mostly surrounded by those dark bands, right, which would lead, lateral inhibition would mean A would be lighter. And that's not what happens. So that's, so that's annoying. And uh, so White's illusion is that it, it, he explains that um, context is really important and that we're interpreting that gray rectangle as being on a white background with black stripes coming through it. And so that larger kind of context is, is brought to bear. And um, lateral explanation cannot easily explain that. We do have neurons that are uh, have excitatory inhibitory kinds of influences on our color vision up at the visual cortex. But so, so we have to, we have to consider this kind of larger interpretation even though what we just explained was lateral inhibition at the level of the retina, that really does not explain uh, White's solution at all. I'll go ahead and get, walk through B. So if you notice, there's more white areas hitting that gray than in A. It should have more lateral inhibition. It should appear darker. That's not what happens. And the assumption is, that we are interpreting that um, gray rectangle as being on a black background with white stripes going through it. That one doesn't work as well for me, but for some of you it, it might. It's hard for me to see the black background. It just looks like a weird illusion. But A works very well for me as, as feeling like the context is that that's on a white background. And so our interpretation of context is influencing our interpretation of the gray squares themselves. Okay, so the final kind of what you really need to know is this, and I have it all on one slide. This is what you can memorize if everything I just said and all those proofs just annoy you and you don't really understand, it's okay. 
just remember lateral inhibition refers to the fact that an excited neuron may reduce the activity of its neighbors. This means that if a single neuron is activated, it's going to respond more strongly than if its neighbors are also stimulated because they're often sending inhibition to neurons along the same path. Lateral inhibition increases our ability to see contrasts and changes in our environment. So this kind of relative light and seeing when things change. And I usually do this explanation with the uh, center surround receptive fields uh, going across a light dark kind of change. And if anybody wants me to do that on Monday, um, I think it will be tricky in Blackboard Collaborate, but I'll, I'll figure out a way to, I'll at least think it through. It might take some time, but I'll, I'll think it through.